Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Mary. I'm a manager in the machine learning group here at ARM. I'm really excited to have you here today, whether it's your morning or your afternoon. We have a really exciting um, tech talk today. Uh, actually, all of them are exciting to me, but today we have uh, Plumerai, and I'm really looking forward to listening uh, to what they have to say. They have the uh, fastest inference engine for ARM Cortex-M. So how fast is this and how did they do it? Which is what we're gonna learn today. So um, let's get going. Just wanna take care of a few housekeeping items. Cedric, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, if you would like to tweet us, here's where you can find us. If you uh, tag AIVTT, we might just give you a follow. So from our, our developer Twitter account. So if you like what you're hearing and you wanna tell people that you've attended, please do that. Uh, you can also find this video on our YouTube channel, which we'll be uh, posting right after this and you can watch this on demand. And we also have some upcoming tech talks that I can tell you about really quickly. Um, this is the link where you go sign up for them. Cedric, if we go to the next slide. Um, this is what's coming up. So. The next tech talk on the 22nd is from Sama. It's uh, about data labeling. And, and as we all know, you can't do machine learning very well without really good data and accurate data. So this is a really great company. One of our only data labeling companies in the partner program right now. So this should be really informative. Um, and then on April 5th, we have a Magimob co coming to talk to us about uh, quantization of LSTM layers by a heuristic approach. Super technical sounding by the title. I would attend just for this. So please tell all your science and computer science minded ML friends to uh, tune into this one. It's going to be good. And then um, in May, we have Kikso, who's a longtime partner of ours. They've done a couple of these tech talks. And uh, they're going to come tell you about what they've done with our ARM virtual hardware, which uh, we announced back in um, October at our tech uh, dev summit. Um, so that is what's coming up. So please go register for those. You don't want to miss out. Um, and let's get going. Next slide. This is, uh, I'd like to introduce Cedric um, from Plumerai. He's uh, a, one of their uh, top software engineers. Um, and you can see that he has got a lot of credentials doing his master's and PhD in Eidhoven University. He mostly um, has worked on optimizing GPU and CPU code for you know, various companies. And he spent about four years doing deep learning for autonomous driving at TomTom, Tom, which is super cool. And now he's at Plumerai and he's writing fast code and he probably writes it fast as well. I'm just gonna say that, Cedric, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine you're pretty quick. So um, this is, this is uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Cedric. We are gonna have Q and A, so please uh, ask questions in the, um, in the Q and A box. Uh, we, this is going to be your opportunity to really understand, you know, how, how you get this kind of speed on Cortex-M. Embedded is not easy, but Cedric will show you how he has made it easy. So Cedric, are you ready? I am. Yes. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Okay. It's all you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so welcome to a demo of the fastest inference engine for uh, Cortex-M. Uh, and in today's talk, there will also be some Tetris playing. Um, my name is Cedric Nuchtere and I'm with Plumerai. And the work I'm presenting here today uh, is not just my own, but also uh, done my, by, by my colleagues. Um, so first, a little bit of an introduction to the company. Uh, Plumerai's goal is to run complex computer vision tasks on tiny devices uh, in an efficient way. And the example application that you see here uh, on itself, the results uh, might be quite impressive, but what's even more impressive is that these things actually run on small devices, uh, such as microcontrollers, which are very resource constrained. Um, we work at various kind of applications at Primrai, and an example of this is person presence detection, uh, which is uh, a task where you have to decide whether there's a person or no person in, uh, in the view. And an example application of this would be a smart doorbell where you would get a notification if there's someone uh, close to your uh, front door. And as you can see, this runs on Cortex-M4, M7, or even larger Cortex-A devices. 
uh, and it does this with quite uh, uh, low latency and uh, good RAM usage and uh, binary size. Uh, but we also work on more complex applications, as I just uh, showed you in the previous slide, uh, this person detection where you actually have to draw a bounding box around uh, the person. And examples of this could be a smart office where you want to do people counting or control the heating or air conditioning of a building, depending on who is where. Uh, and this is a little bit more heavy application, but still runs uh, very efficiently on, for example, Cortex-M7. Um, now, we get to this efficiency partly uh, by using uh, binarized neural networks, or BNNs for short. So typically, when you train your neural networks, you will train them with 32-bit floating points. But when you deploy them, especially for small devices such as microcontrollers and mobile phones, you will go to 8-bit um, integer. But you can actually go uh, even beyond that and go to 4-bit, 2-bit, or what we do at Kumrai, go to one bit, uh, uh, both for activations and weights. And if you do that, then your convolutions become quite interesting because, uh, so convolutions are the main uh, computational bottlenecks of, of a lot of these networks, uh, but a normal multiplication in, in one bit suddenly becomes an XNOR operation that you can run efficiently on, uh, on, on this kind of hardware. Uh, and similarly, the summation becomes a pop count, which can also be done quite efficiently. But it's not that easy because training these networks is, is quite complicated. And we had a few presentations before where we explained this in, in more depth. And we did a lot of research about this at the company. And uh, some of it is actually uh, available open source in the form of the LARC ecosystem. So if you're interested in BNNs, uh, you should uh, check that out. But that's not the topic uh, for today's talk. So uh, let me give a little bit of background how we got to this uh, point where I want to talk about the inference engine. So we discovered that we actually need to cover the entire stack if we want to get this high efficiency on these small devices. So we have our own data pipeline with our own uh, training data uh, collected and, and managed properly, uh, training algorithms, uh, BNN models, uh, an inference stack to deploy it on devices, uh, but we even also make our own uh, IP, our own hardware blocks. Um, but that is also not the topic for today's talk. Um, but these BNN models, uh, when you look close at the, closely at them, they don't just contain binarized layers. So there's also more traditional layers that are in eight, uh, so eight bit integer quantized. Um, and we want to be fast for all those kind of layers. So our inference stack uh, needs to be fast and uh, memory efficient, not just for these binarized layers, but also for the normal uh, conventional int 8 layers. And um, by optimizing also for those, uh, it turned out that we actually have the world's fastest deep learning inference software for Cortex-M. Right, so that's the topic for today's talk. And this is not about those binarized neural networks, but just about normal 8-bit integer uh, networks. So um, let's look at a quick overview of today's talk. I will first answer the question, what is an inference engine in a bit more detail? So we're all on the same page. Then I will look at this table that we published a couple of months ago and go in depth into these numbers and show other numbers uh, to answer the question, are we really that efficient? And then I will also give a live demo of our recently launched public benchmarking service where you can try out your own models. And lastly, I will go into uh, quite some technical detail of what we did to become so efficient. And this is also where the Tetris playing comes in. So what is an inference engine? So if you look, uh, take one step back and look at the full machine learning flow, you typically start with training, uh, with designing an, a neural network architecture, or you take one from, from uh, elsewhere, you train it on your own data, uh, and, and you iterate a couple of times. And at some point, you're satisfied with, with accuracy, and you want to deploy this in production. And that is when you want to run inference. Uh, and inference means running just a forward pass of your neural network. And 
uh, in the context of uh, tiny and efficient devices, you will typically do this in 8-bit integer uh, quantized. So both the weights and activations will be represented by 8-bit integers. And you do this on a small device, for example, on a microcontroller. And when you run this on the microcontroller, you would hope that that microcontroller runs efficient and optimized code. And that is where this inference engine comes in. So the inference engine is the software that runs on the microcontroller at inference time during the deployment of your code. So it has nothing to do with training. So to uh, go one step deeper, let's look at an example uh, inference engine. Um, and I identified three main tasks that an inference engine should do. So on the left, you see an example uh, model architecture, model graph with a couple of layers that need to be executed. And the first task of the inference engine is actually to execute those layers in the correct order. And TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers is such an example inference engine targeted for Cortex-M uh, that does this. And, and it, it, uh, internally that is called the uh, model interpreter. The second task is to plan the activations and the weights, so all the tensors, in memory in some efficient way. And I will get back to this uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, but this is also something that TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers does. And the third main task is to provide optimized code for all those kind of layer types that you might encounter in your network. For example, convolutions, fully connected, so on. And TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers also does that, um, but it does outsource some of it to an external library, which is ARM CMSYS NN, uh, which is a, a library of optimized code for Cortex-A and Cortex-M uh, devices uh, made by ARM. And it implements the most important layers, such as convolution, pooling, and fully connected. So together, this forms uh, the inference engine. So let's go to, uh, back to these numbers that I presented, that we presented in, uh, in a blog post earlier. So here's the table. Um, and if you look closely, you can see that we tested this on MobileNet V2, which is uh, a, a quite important uh, neural network architecture that is quite widely used uh, for these kind of uh, low, uh, low power devices. And um, if you look at the table, you can see TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers there. And this is an open source framework that I believe most, most of you uh, are using today. Uh, and if, uh, if you look then at the results for our inference engine, you can see that it's quite a lot faster and uh, uses almost half the amount of RAM. So this is quite significant. But also if you compare it to some of the other inference engines that we could find out there, uh, this is still a very significant step. And I want to stress here that we don't do any tricks here, right? So this is not about binarized neural networks or something like that. Uh, this is normal int eight precision networks. There's no pruning here. Uh, the accuracy really remains the same uh, for all these different inference engines in this table. Now you might say, well, they chose one network and they might tune for that network and they're very good just for mobile net V2. So to answer that question, I went online and searched for as many uh, neural network architectures that I could find that are publicly available and ran them all through our inference engine. So I ended up with this whole list of, uh, of models from various places, mostly like kind of model zoos, TF hub, these kind of places. There's the ARM uh, ML zoo uh, that provided a lot of models. Uh, and I took all the models that are int 8 uh, quantized and are targeted for Cortex-M and Cortex-A devices. And we run all these models uh, on some example uh, microcontrollers and reported uh, latency and RAM usage, both for our inference engine and for TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers uh, for comparison. And here are the results. So on the x-axis here, you see all those uh, models that I, that I collected from the internet. And then on the top graph, you see speed up. Uh, and this is compared to TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. In the bottom graph, you see the RAM reduction factor. 
So anything above this orange 1.x line means that our inference engine performs better in that metric uh, compared to TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. And these differences are not small. They're not like a few percent, but they can be like 50% or even a factor two uh, faster uh, or uh, less RAM. So this is very, uh, very significant. So this is for Cortex-M4. I have a similar graph here for uh, Cortex-M7. Results are roughly uh, the same, but of course they do change a little bit. So on average, we get 53% speed up, a 45% RAM reduction factor. Now, again, I have to uh, stress this, that accuracy remains the same, right? The only thing that changes here are the speed and the memory requirements, uh, but the results of the network are still exactly the same. Now, there are a few models here in the bottom left corner where actually we do a little bit worse in terms of uh, RAM usage. And one might wonder why this is the case. Um, so we took a closer look at those models. And it turns out, first of all, those are very small models with just like four or five layers. And for most of them, actually, it's just one or two layers that dominate the full execution time. So they are a bit of niche uh, models and might not be that representative. But still, it's interesting to look at why are we uh, worse in terms of RAM, uh, but do perform better in terms of latency. And it turns out there's uh, some knobs in our inference engine that we can tune. And we can uh, actually trade off uh, RAM usage uh, versus speed. So to get a bit more insight into that, um, we took a closer look at two of those uh, four models. And here you see uh, RAM usage versus latency uh, of uh, the TensorFlow Lite microcontrollers uh, result in orange. And uh, with an uh, arrow indicated the results that I shown uh, on the previous slide. So on top of that, we did a few more uh, benchmarks, uh, three in this case and four in the other, where we changed this knob uh, slightly. So, uh, for example, if you start here and you go towards the bottom, it means you use a less RAM, uh, but it does come at a small cost in terms of latency, as you can see if you go uh, to this point here. Um, so we can actually tune this RAM versus latency uh, to some extent. And I want to um, stress here that our solutions are actually Pareto optimal. So that, that means that the TensorFlow Lite for microcontroller solution, uh, although our baseline uses less RAM, uh, more RAM, uh, in, in general, our, per, our solutions are Pareto optimal. That means we are always a better choice, at least for those two uh, models. So in practice, how this works is that you might have a very specific RAM requirement, right? You might say, okay, I have one megabyte available, uh, just use as much as you want. So, um, we did tune this knob to be good in the general case, and those are the benchmarks that I, sh I showed before. Uh, but of course, uh, per model, we can tune this on demand if needed. So I also want to highlight a few other models from the graphs before, and those are models that are part of the MLPerf tiny benchmark suite. There are four models. Uh, for different kinds of applications. And here I show the same results as before for those models, um, uh, but in, in absolute numbers. So our uh, latency in milliseconds compared to TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. And we run this on a couple of boards. So here's an ST board. Uh, we run this on an Infinium board as well with very similar results. Um, and uh, we get very good speed ups here. And we did run this also uh, on a couple of other uh, boards with similar results, uh, but uh, I won't uh, show all those graphs. Uh, we hope to also run on, on M55 soon. So this is for latency, uh, but same results, uh, of similar results, of course, hold also for RAM. And here we actually reduce it by a factor two on average. So why are these benchmarks so important? Um, well, that is not just uh, that is because they are uh, selected by the organization behind MLPerf, which is ML Commons, and they are selected to be representative 
four typical applications on microcontrollers. Uh, and they are actual real applications that someone might run. And what's more, there's a, 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 the option to submit your own results to this MLPerf tiny benchmark suite. And that's what we did uh, 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 not so long ago. Uh, and these results are still under review, so they're not published yet. But we did submit to the latest uh, uh, version of MLPerf. And what this means is that actually we had to measure using uh, the MLPerf standard way of measuring latency, right? So that does mean that these latency numbers are uh, properly measured in, in some standard way. But maybe more importantly, it also means that we had to measure accuracy. So how good uh, does the model actually perform on a full validation or test set for those specific applications on the actual device? And that just uh, reinforces the statement that I mentioned earlier, that it's just latency and RAM that changed. Accuracy remains exactly the same. OK, um, but you saw before in the uh, benchmarks that uh, latency and RAM is not always the same, or that the, the speed up is not always the same. It depends a lot on your model. So we came up with this idea, why not let other people submit their model to us so we can show you exactly what it means for your own model. So that's um, how we came up with this public benchmarking service. And the way it works is that there's a website where you can upload your own uh, TF Lite model. And actually, any model that runs with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers will be supported by our public benchmarking service and also by our inference engine. And after you submit it, it will run on some microcontrollers in our lab. Um, and it will run with our inference engine, uh, but also with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, just for reference. And then a few minutes later, you will get back an email uh, with the results in terms of latency on RAM for two different uh, devices, an M4 and an M7 device. And these are just example boards, right? Our inference engine runs with, with different boards from all kinds of different vendors. So why not try it out uh, right now? I promised a live demo. So let's go to plumerai.com slash benchmark. Um, there we go, there's our website. Um, and we can choose a TF Lite file here. And let's choose some uh, VWW visual wake words model from the MLPerf. Uh, benchmark suite, and I'll fill in my name. So my name is Sylvie Knuchteren, and I'm with Plumerai, and this is my email address. Um, now I'll submit the model, um, and if all goes well, uh, this will run uh, in our lab. Uh, and it does tell us it takes three to 30 minutes. Of course, that depends a bit on how busy it is at the moment. We don't have this uh, fully scalable uh, solution, of course. Um, while we wait for the results to come in, maybe we should continue with the slides. So let's go into a bit more technical details now and um, talk a bit about what we did to become so efficient. So we identified two main topics here. First of all, we do better memory planning. And secondly, we have optimized a model specific code for Cortex-M devices. So first, let's talk about memory planning. So memory planning is the task of placing all your tensors somewhere in memory. And these tensors are activations, so that means inputs and outputs of networks, uh, of layers, sorry. Uh, but that also means the weights, uh, weight tensors themselves. All of those need to be placed somewhere in memory. And if you do this in a smart way, you can reuse memory uh, blocks, memory regions over time, because not all those activations, uh, not all those tensors are needed for the full uh, duration of an, uh, an inference run. So that is uh, memory planning. Let's um, uh, talk about it in a bit more detail. So I like to see memory planning as a game of Tetris. Now, I grew up in the 90s, so that means that I play uh, Tetris on the Game Boy, but uh, feel free to use another device of your own choice if you want. And actually, I learned recently, you can also play Tetris on a Cortex-M. So here's a small 
uh, picture of someone uh, playing here in a small window, a Tetris, and there are three buttons that uh, he or she can press. Um, so how does this game work? Well, it's basically the same as a normal Tetris game. So on the x-axis, you have, uh, in this case, time. Uh, in the context of a neural network, that means layer execution. So a single forward pass will be from left to right. So ex you execute through the layers of your network. On the y-axis, then you have RAM size. Uh, starting at the bottom and the top will be the maximum RAM size of your device. Then each Tetris block will be a tensor uh, that you have to place somewhere. And the objective of the game is the same as before you should try to use as little RAM as possible. So let's try to play this game. Um, and uh, here on the left, you see an example neural network that I came up with just for the purpose of this presentation uh, with a couple of layers in dark blue. And in between are colored boxes that represent activation, uh, activation tensors. And I will plan them in uh, using Tetris. Now, this is a bit of a simplified view because normally there might possibly be weight tensors and other intermediate tensors to be planned, but uh, the story remains the same. So for the purpose of this presentation, I will only plan the activations. So if you look at my tensor screen, on the x-axis, you see that I now uh, place the names of the layers in the order in which they will execute and I actually put some white lines here to divide the screen in different columns to indicate when a certain layer will be executed. On the y-axis, then I put RAM usage, ranging from 0 to 640 kilobytes, which is apparently the size that I have available on this target device. Now let's try to plan those, uh, play the game and plan those tensors in. So my first block that comes in from the top, like in a normal Tetris game, uh, is the A tensor. And I decide to put it here uh, at this location. Now the width of this tensor uh, and the height are determined by your neural network architecture. Uh, I can't change them anymore at this stage. So the width is determined because it needs to be kept alive during a certain time. So tensor A is used only as input to conf 2 d So that means it has a lifetime of just this one, uh, uh, one single layer execution. And the height is then determined by the size, the shape of the tensor. So it might be a RGB image of a certain resolution and that determines the height. And actually, normally in Tetris, you can move these blocks around on the x-axis as well, but I don't have the freedom. I can only move them on the y-axis because they have to be kept alive during a certain time. The next block comes in, block B. Uh, and this one is a very wide one. And that is because it needs to be kept alive during a long time. It's the output of the first layer. So it needs to be available during execution of the first layer. It's the input to the second layer, but also to this add layer, right? This kind of skip connection that you might see in residual networks, for example. Uh, so that determines its width and also its exposition. And the height is determined by the size. So maybe we did some uh, downsampling, strided convolution in the first layer, and that's why this is a bit, uh, it's not as tall as, as uh, block A. Um, but I can move it anywhere on the uh, y-axis and I decided to put it as much to the bottom as I, as I can uh, without interfering with A. Now block C comes in and I can actually move it around a little bit and put it all the way here in the bottom. Um, uh, because apparently that's the heuristic I'm using at the moment to play this game and we'll later see if that is a good heuristic or not. I put them as much as I can to the bottom. And again, the width I can't change and the X location I can't change. It's determined by the neural network architecture. Um, now, next block that comes in is block E, uh, not block D, because the order in which these blocks come in is actually determined by the memory planning. So I can control that. And apparently I decided it's a good thing to put block E in. We'll see later if that's actually true. Um, so put block E in. Then I'm putting uh, block D in. It doesn't fit anymore in this space because it's quite uh, high. So I have to put it all the way there on the top of B. Uh, then F comes in, fits there nicely. And then G. And G is again a very uh, large one, although it still only exists for, uh, for the output layer. Uh, but it's too much. It doesn't fit in my Tetris screen. 
which means it's game over. I can't run this neural network on this device. Uh, that's a bit unfortunate because if I would have played the game of Tetris a bit better, uh, maybe I could have fit this in. So let's clear the screen and do uh, make another attempt. So in this attempt, I'll use the same heuristic as before, put all the blocks as much as possible to the bottom, but the order in which they come in is different. And remember, I can choose this order because I'm writing a memory plan. So let's say block B comes in, put it all the way to the bottom. Same for F, put it there nicely. A, all the way at the bottom. C, there's a small gap, but uh, so be it. Uh, then block G, D, and E come in. And that's actually everything. So now my memory requirement is only 500 kilobytes. And it does fit, so I can actually run this neural network on this uh, microcontroller. Now remember, I didn't change the sizes nor the y uh, x positions of these tensors. I just changed the y position uh, and basically the, the order in which they come in. Now this game of Tetris, or at least the game of memory planning uh, for a neural network, turns out to be an empty hard problem. So it is not possible to, to uh, find an uh, optimal solution here for the general case. But what we can do is try to become, uh, to be quite smart in terms of what we do in terms of heuristics uh, and in terms of the order in which these blocks come in. Um, now you might imagine uh, that uh, some of those heuristics uh, work better for certain networks, others for others. So it is not that trivial to find, uh, to make a good memory planning uh, planner, uh, but we did uh, do quite well and did do uh, quite a bit better than TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Now there's one extra trick that we did uh, in the game of Tetris, and that is what we call lower granularity planning. So we, in the beginning, I divided the screen in six columns, but you can divide further. So let's take the first add layer and put another white line there in the middle. So we divide the add operation in sort of two parts, add the first half and add the second half. And this add operation is an operation where you add two tensors, uh, D and B, and you add them element, element wise to produce element wise results in E. So actually during the first half of your add operation, you don't need the, out, the full output E to be allocated. Uh, and during the second half of your uh, add operation, you don't need the full input D anymore because you've already consumed that. So if we look at tensor D here, we can actually uh, change it like this. We can make a small, uh, take a small uh, uh, bit out of it uh, because during the second half, we only need the second half of tensor D. And the same holds for tensor E, uh, which is the output tensor uh, in this case. We can remove part of the allocation for the input uh, during the first half of the execution of add. So if we do that, it actually becomes a shape like this and it nicely fits in together. Now this again changes our memory requirements and uh, gives us even better uh, uh, results. Now you can imagine that maybe for a uh, element-wise operation like an add layer, this is relatively easy to do. But for convolution, uh, the memory access patterns are a bit more complicated. So it's not always possible uh, or not that easy to uh, do these kind of optimization. But in summary, uh, those are the two main uh, contributions for our inference engine in terms of memory uh, planning. We get lower RAM usage by smart tensor placement and lower granularity planning. And I need to say here that uh, these RAM numbers throughout the whole presentations, we try to be as fair as possible. So all the memory allocation is static in our inference engine. And most of it is done by the memory planning, uh, including all those temporary buffers and so on. Uh, and we report the full um, uh, RAM numbers. Now, the second topic is uh, optimized code for speed. So there are two parts to this. First of all, uh, the code itself is optimized. So what that means is that for this example graph here, uh, each different layer, we provide optimized code. 
So for example, for Comp2D, which is one of the most important parts, uh, we use this im to call and gem approach, which is a well-known technique. So image to column and generalized matrix multiplication to optimize Comp2D. But we also optimize other layers like an add uh, layer, even though they are less important, we also need to provide optimized code for those and for many other layers, of course. But we go one step further and also optimize for special cases of certain layer types. So for example, we see that there's a lot of one by one convolutions. It means we might be able to write specialized codes for those cases, uh, as opposed to three by three or five by five convolutions. And I mentioned the word optimized codes a lot in, in this uh, particular slide. So let me try to give you a few hints of what that uh, means. So here are some example code optimizations that we do. So we do have handwritten assembly in our inference engine if really needed. So if the compiler doesn't do uh, what we want it to do, we have handwritten assembly. And we do specialize a lot for Cortex-M4 and M7 and other uh, Cortex-M or Cortex-A platforms. So we really look at the instruction manual, see what kind of operations are available. Is it possible to add an extra free shift here for this operation? or uh, how many cycles does it take? What's the throughput of each instruction? We also look at registers a lot because they are quite, uh, uh, there are not that many of them on these devices. So we really have to take those into account when we optimize code. But we also do things like C++ template-based loop unrolling for better speed, or we might do things, uh, some pre-processing steps, for example, to, to reorder the weights in memory, such that later when you run inference, the memory access patterns uh, get better. So that is one part of uh, how we got better speed. But there's also the part of model-specific code. And let me try to explain that on this slide. So on the left, you first see the model agnostic approach. And this is what TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers does. So you'll have a model interpreter and you have some optimized codes and you compile that together into a binary. And uh, that's together with some model data is running on the device. And the advantage of this is that you can easily swap your model data out for other model data. And then you can reuse the same interpreter and same optimized code. Uh, but in reality, most people anyway, recompile the whole thing to another binary if they change the model. Uh, so that advantage, I don't think in practice is that important. So in the model specific approach instead, you don't have this interpreter anymore. You just have your model data, your specification of the model and, and, the, and the weights and so on. And you have your optimized code and you compile that together and run that on your device. And an example inference engine that does this is micro TVM, but also plumerized inference engine does this. And I'll try to explain in the next slide what this means in practice and why this, is, uh, this can be better in certain cases. So here is an example of some C++ code on the left and some compiled assembly on the right. And you don't have to understand the details here, um, but I try to keep it as simple as possible. So here I wrote a small for loop where we multiply some elements in a source uh, array uh, and we store them in some destination array. And if you look color coded, you can see that the compiled assembly in yellow shows there's a load instruction, there's a shift, which influences the multiplication, uh, and a store operation. And then in green, you can see there's a loop here, a loop label, a compare instruction, and a branch. And this is this loop implementing this loop over num channels. And this code looks reasonably nice, but you can do better. So if you take the same code now, but you just change num channels, and you just type three, then the compiler will generate completely different code. It now knows there's three of them, so it will generate only loads, stores, and uh, shifts. There's no need for this branch and compare instruction anymore. Um, and in this case, actually, the uh, binary size is even smaller than the other one, although in reality, that's not always the case, of course. So in this model-specific approach, if you do it right, then you can tell the compiler what num channels is or some other parameters, of course. This is just a toy example. And it can generate this, if it wants to, 
generates this uh, optimized, in this case, unrolled code with just the operations that you're interested in. And that is a bit the benefit of the model specific approach. So in summary, for better speeds, uh, we do two things. We have this optimized code for Cortex M, but we also use this model specific code generation technique. And that's what gives us this good speed uh, compared to other inference engines. Okay, I see I got a new email. Um, let's see if that's the case. Uh, yes, there we go. And there's a new uh, email from our public benchmark service. And it did run uh, on two uh, uh, microcontrollers. And it does show that our inference engine uh, gets better uh, latency and lower RAM usage for this particular model. So that's good. Um, let's go back to the presentation. And actually, uh, I've reached my conclusion of this talk now. Um, so let me recap what we saw today. Uh, so we saw the world's fastest inference engine uh, for Cortex-M. Uh, we looked a bit at those numbers in, in more detail. I showed a lot more numbers to really back this up, that it's not just for one specific model. Uh, and you can actually try it out yourself if you want to. Um, and I also tried to explain uh, why this is the case, right? So the better memory planning uh, and uh, the more optimized uh, code that we provide. And at Plumerai, we do a lot more than just this. This int 8 inference engine that I presented today is just one of the things that we do, right? Uh, we also do these binarized neural networks, um, and we work on these other, uh, on full applications, such as person presence detection and person detection. Uh, and we make our own uh, IP core, uh, for example, uh, targeting FPGAs from Lattice and Phoenix. And we do actually cover this whole uh, stack to really get efficient um, machine learning, efficient deep learning onto microcontrollers. So I want to leave you with this uh, slide about our public benchmarking service. I would really try to encourage you to, uh, to try it out yourself with your own models. If you have any questions, uh, then do contact us at hello at plumerai.com. Or of course, you can ask any questions uh, right now. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cedric. That was, uh, that was, I've, I've not ever seen Tetris used to, you know, visually communicate sort of how the memory planning that's really well done. Also, I want one of those tiny Cortex M4 Tetris games with the three buttons. You have to tell me how to, how I get my hands on one of those. Um, we do have questions and yeah, I think we have just enough time to, we hit the top of the hour to get through uh, all of these. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for posting your questions. So let's get to it. Um, uh, have you used ML models with LSTM or GRU in your tests? Uh, so that's a good question about LSTMs. Uh, so they, uh, as long as they work with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, they do work also with our inference engine. I think there are uh, two or three of them in this uh, in this list. So later, if you have a chance to look at the slide, uh, I think we benchmarked uh, some there as well. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be making these slides available for download when we post the videos. So if some of the data was a little hard to see on the screen, you'll be able to get the full deck and study it at your leisure. Um, let's see. Net, let's get to some more questions. Uh, Mazam has asked uh, a few questions here. Uh, what about parallelism? Is that supported? And can we select different devices for running the models on Plumerai AI model uh, portal? So let's go the first one about parallelism. So uh, in terms of parallelism for Cortex M, actually we don't do anything there. Um, I don't think we've tested with uh, with multi-core uh, Cortex M devices yet. For Cortex A, uh, we also uh, run inference of our models, and there we do do uh, multi-threading. Yes. Um, cool. And then in terms of selecting your own uh, microcontrollers uh, in the public benchmarking service, that is not possible. But if you are interested in a particular device, we can try to attach it there, right? Our lab doesn't have uh, hundreds of microcontrollers attached, of course. But uh, if you're interested in one of them, uh, do ask us and we can either attach it or we can run it uh, for you just by hand. 
Cool. Um, next question is, would it take a process time for memory allocation planning? So the memory allocation, uh, everything that I showed is actually done offline because you know your model. Uh, so uh, there's no need to do this at runtime. So in TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, this is done indeed at runtime, but we do this offline. It's done once, it doesn't cost any uh, time on a microcontroller. Great. That's excellent. Uh, AJ is asking, have you tried or planning to target VHDL for running models on FPGAs? Uh, so that's a question a bit uh, outside the scope of this talk, but indeed in, uh, in uh, one of the last slides, I uh, said that we also work, uh, so we design our own HDL yeah. code uh, that we, uh, where we mainly target FPGAs indeed. So uh, that's also a possibility. So I guess AJ, contact them directly if you want further information on that. You can reach them at hello at Um Jeffrey says, excellent talk. Thanks, Jeffrey. I also thought it was an excellent talk. Uh, and his question is, what is the overhead trade-off computation to do the memory plan? Tetris and Greynu, any benchmark? Uh, thank you for the nice words. Uh, so this is, I think, the same question as before. So there's no overhead because this is done offline once actually on your, you can do this on your laptop, basically. You don't have to run this on a microcontroller. So that there's no overhead. Cool. Um, that's good. Uh, Mazam comments that thanks, Cedric, because it's hard to find the devices for research experiments outside. So excellent talk. So uh, yeah, Mazam, if you are, if again, if there's a device that you would like to see, just contact Plumerai and they can work with you to perhaps make that uh, available to you. Um, let's see. I think uh, there's another, this is a good question um, from Punit. What are the privacy policies when we submit our models for benchmarking? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I forgot to mention perhaps, uh, actually you can see this on this particular slide in the bottom left. It does say we will not reuse reverse engineer or steal your model. Uh, we will not sell it, uh, uh, but we do, uh, uh, store it for our own purpose. If something goes wrong, for example, or if it's slower than expected, we might want to retry, uh, retry it. Um, uh, and there's full details in the privacy policy. Uh, but if you, um, if you want something else for your particular case, uh, then maybe you should not upload it uh, to the public benchmarking service, but instead you might uh, just uh, contact us and we can, uh, we can maybe remove your model di directly afterwards, for example. Great. A um, couple more questions. Let's see, will, uh, will your solution work with any model or are there restrictions to what kind of layers are supported? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we do build our inference engine on top of TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. So we do provide the optimized code for a lot of layers and some of our techniques like the memory planning and the model agnostic approach work for a lot of uh, layers also that we might not provide optimized code for. Um, but for any other models, uh, any other layers, sorry, uh, we fall back to TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. So if there's something very exotic that has just been released in the latest TensorFlow Lite, uh, then it is already supported by our inference engine. Great. And then uh, will your inference engine also give similar speed ups on Cortex M55, which is the, the newest IP that's just coming out from ARM? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm very excited to start working on the so M55. Am I. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm quite convinced it will because some of the techniques that we use are very generic, like the model specific approach, the memory planning and so on. Uh, but of course, we need to look at the, uh, the optimized code for particular kernels, which might need some tweaking here and there to get, uh, get good results uh, or, or yeah, even better results. Yeah, so, so you have to come back and do a, a, another presentation on, yes. on the M55 <laughs> uh, experiments that you've done. I'm, I'm very interested in that. Um, let's see, Punit has one other question. And what is the peak power usage? It's, it's kind of generic. I, I don't know, Punit, if you can provide some more context as to uh, the question, but I guess maybe what, what the peak power usage for the models that you described today. Yeah, that's be. a good 
very subjective possibly. That's a question I don't have any answer to. And if we just measure latency and RAM usage, and I think on these devices, um, uh, power use or energy consumption is, is linear to latency, almost linear. Yeah. Uh, so if your model runs faster, your energy usage will be lower. And I think power consumption on a microcontroller stays the same, but I, I, uh, I wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, fair enough. One more question that's just come in. Um, actually, a couple of them. I think we have a few more minutes. Um, anonymous attendee, uh, excellent talk. Thanks for that. Uh, and uh, asking, wondering if you've compared your solution with micro TVM. Uh, so I did uh, didn't mention this in the in the talk, but I think it was there on the slide that uh, at least in October we tried out micro TVM. Uh, but it would use too much RAM, so uh, it wouldn't run the models on our uh, devices. So we couldn't put that uh, in the table. We couldn't measure latency. Um, but I was told recently uh, they improved their memory planning uh, in micro TVM. So we should have a look at it uh, again soon and see uh, how we compare to that. That's a good question. Yeah, great question. Um, Jeffrey has another question that has come in is, uh, which is as to the hard code model channel number for code optimization example channels equals three versus a variable. What will be the trade offs in term of flexibility based on your experience and or observation. Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the trade off is that you have to know your all the details of your model when you compile it. So if you want to run another model later on on your microcontroller, you have to recompile it. But I think that's not uh, not a big issue. Uh, one trade-off might be in some cases um, that you use uh, more uh, binary size, so your code becomes bigger. In the example where I put the number three, actually code becomes smaller. So there's also, uh, in some cases, code becomes also actually smaller, even if you unroll it. Uh, because other overhead and branch instructions and so on are removed. But in some cases, it becomes larger. Um, what we've seen overall is on average, it doesn't change that much. Uh, so for smaller models, typically you will win in terms of code size. For larger models, you will lose a little bit in terms of code size, but it's not that much. Great. Um, and Edwin just commented that M55 has TCM support, so two Tetris games at the same time. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> um, I think we went through all the questions. Thank you everybody so much for attending and thanks Cedric. This was really, really informative uh, presentation. Again, it really uh, was a, an excellent um, uh, explanation of all that memory planning with the Tetris game. Um, so yeah, thank you. And, and also thank you uh, and ARM for, for hosting this and giving us the opportunity to. Uh, Absolutely. To I'm looking forward to having you guys back after you've had a chance to play with M55. And um, I'm also looking forward to some of the, the use cases that you come up with uh, as with this extra power, you're not constrained quite as much. So it'd be really, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with, definitely. Um, so for, for everybody out there, please uh, don't hesitate to, to use the benchmark tool that I think that's a, a, a really great service. And again, they're very flexible, as Cedric says, if you have a question or you're, you're not seeing anything that you need some help with, just please contact them directly at hello at plumerai.com. Um, they're happy to work with you. This is a great opportunity to um, work directly with, you know, these, these amazing machine learning engineering companies that are building this market as, as we go. We're kind of in, this is one of the things I enjoy about this space is we kind of, we're inventing this as, as, as we go right now. Um, so it's very, very uh, dynamic and, and compelling to me. So I hope you all feel the same way. And uh, which I think you do, cause you're here and uh, learning all about um, machine learning on ARM and all the different uh, partners that, that are developing solutions. So with that, please uh, check back the YouTube channel, our developer channel uh, early next week, this presentation will be available on demand. So please share it with people that you think could, um, you know, learn something from this or, and also the deck will be available for download. So with that, I will uh, say goodbye. Thank you again, Cedric. It was such a pleasure and we'll be talking again, I'm sure. And have a great day, everybody. And we'll see you next time at the next Tech Talk.
See you later. Bye. Bye.